Hello. So we're going to talk about what are some strategies that we can use as we're facilitating our learners' use of data that can help them draw their conclusions from the data a bit better or sort of build that muscle of how to draw conclusions from data that they're working with and looking at. So some strategies we can use are kind of broken out into two different components. The, the ones listed on the right-hand side of the screen in the light blue are common strategies that we use in a variety of different ways when we're teaching. They're good pedagogical practices. And what I've done is with the link at the bottom of the page, you can go to the website and find an articulation of how do we do these specifically with working with data and think about sort of how it's slightly similar and slightly different than when we're working with other kinds of content that we're helping our students make sense of. What I want to do is spend a little bit of time picking apart each of these ones in dark blue on the left hand side of the screen in this video for you. So first let's start with argument mapping. Argument mapping is a technique that's used often in English language arts and social studies classrooms, which means our learners are learning these skills or have learned these skills previously. And so we just need to leverage them to our advantage when we're working with data. So the way argument mapping works is that the, end of the user reads through usually some text and finds and marks what the claim or the conclusion is within the information that they're taking in. They also find and mark the evidence and reasoning, or this could be called the premise or premises um, that's within the information. And then they physically draw the relationship between the conclusion and the premise or between the claim and what we call the evidence and reasoning often in science using the CER framework. So let's look at some examples. So here's an example from English language arts. And um, I am a Red Sox, lifelong Red Sox fan, so I'm making no statements about this, but this is an example. So the New York Yankees have won more World Series championships than any other team in baseball history. Therefore, the New York Yankees are the greatest team in baseball history. So if this is the text that we're reading, in English language arts, what we do is we start picking it apart. So the evidence piece is they've won more World Series championships than any other team in history. That is a piece of evidence. And the claim or the conclusion is, is that they are the greatest team in history. So, and then we've identified our evidence piece and our claim piece, and then we physically draw out that this one piece of evidence leads to the claim. Some other examples are participating in musical ensembles like orchestras and choruses is fun. Okay, that's a piece of evidence. Participating in musical ensembles also teaches valuable lessons about discipline and teamwork. Apologies for the typo. That's a second piece of evidence. So these are different pieces of evidence about musical ensembles. Therefore, children should be encouraged to participate in musical ensembles. That is the claim, right? That's what we're proposing or projecting forward. The conclusion is that our students should participate. So in this example, we have one piece of evidence that leads to the claim and a second independent piece of evidence that also leads to the second claim. So we can have one piece of evidence, we can have multiple pieces of evidence coming into a claim. Looking at this third example, children should be protected from media that might encourage them to do dangerous things. Okay, that's, that's a piece of evidence. Violent video games might encourage children to do dangerous things. Now, there's a relationship in that second piece of evidence to the first one, right? And so we can note that by evidence piece one of you know, to protect them from you know, protect them from media that might encourage them to do dangerous things, and evidence piece two of violent video games might be examples of that kind of media. So those two pieces together fit together to the last st statement in the paragraph of, therefore children should not be allowed to purchase violent video games without parental consent. So these are just three of many different ways that we map out our arguments, that we actually write out, build out our arguments. And in English language arts or social studies, or even in science where our, our students are looking at more prose to take in information, it can be helpful to physically mark up the page and create a graphical representation of how that argument builds. And the thing is we can do this with data as well, helping our students work with data. So let me orient you to the data that we're looking at. 
we are looking at data of the American lobster. So this is the iconic lobster. You know, they are red after we cook them. That's why we often see them red, but they're actually sort of a greenish, bluish, yellow color when they are alive. And what we're looking at is a time series. So from the mid 1960s here along the X axis, all the way across the different decades up to the mid 2010, so up to 2015. So our time series is along the X axis. And what the data are that we're looking at is if you surveyed all of the lobster, all of the American lobster on off the east coast of the United States, so some orientation here is New York, so off the east coast of the United States, and you figured out where each of those lobsters were, and then you averaged that all together, what would be the average latitude that the, that the lobster would be at? So it's not every individual lobster is at that, it's just like across all the lobsters that are out there in the population, where's, where's that average latitude that they're at for, for each year? So each of these points represents an average for each year of where we found the sort of central, where was the average location, average latitude. For those of you that don't think in latitude, I just provided a visual cue of 40 degrees north is about here in central New Jersey, 40 degrees north. And so we could use data like this if we were thinking about looking at human impacts on the population, you know, on populations, on natural populations over time. And so we can provide students a graphic like this and have them look at it and be like, okay, so what's What's going on with where we find our American lobsters over time? And so we can have our students physically start drawing in what they notice on the chart. So this is similar to the I squared um, or the or technique where, but here they're like physically drawing in, they're circling or squaring, identifying different components of the graph that jump out to them that they notice. And then they also sort of to take it to that next step of thinking about, okay, so how are each of these variables changing over time? Like what's going on from the left side on the x-axis to the right side on the x-axis? Okay, it's getting bigger. As we move to the right, time has passed. And so we, you know, the years are adding up. Actually on this right side, we're getting closer to present day. And on the left side, we're farther away. We could do that for the y-axis as well and thinking about, okay, based on these data, um, there's, you know, they started low and they're getting up high, they're moving over time. So if we combine those two, right, that's how each individual variable is changing and we can physically draw those lines on the charts to give us those visual cues of what's going on with the data, we can then physically draw in, like not, you know, just sort of a gross general, what's going on with the data, oh, as, as time increases, latitude has increased as well. So we're just having our students physically draw on the graph to give these visual cues as they're looking for different things that are going on in the graph, identifying those patterns. And then we can come back and we can think about, we can use that, those physical drawings on the page to help us both write our evidence statements and our claim, as well as map it out. So here, what we might use is, one piece of evidence is that the central latitude for American lobster was around 40 and a half degrees north in the 1960s. Another piece of evidence is that it was around 43 degrees north in the 2010s. So those are two pieces of, of evidence that we have that we've identified. Therefore, the distribution of American lobster has moved north from the 1960s to the 2010s. And so by physically drawing on the map and articulating it out, we're giving those visual cues, we're using a skill that our learners probably have from other classrooms and applying it in this data context. So that's an example with argument mapping. Visual hypotheses is another example. We're sort of building on a similar thing of providing these visual cues for our learners to help them make more sense. And so what you do is we often write out our hypotheses or our predictions as to what we expect we're going to see in the data. And that's fantastic, except that requires an extra cognitive step for our learners when they're actually looking at the graphic, looking at the data, right? Because they have to read the words, read the prose of the, of the written hypothesis, think inside their head, convert those written words into visually what would they would look like, and then compare that visual representation in their head to what they're actually seeing visually on the page with the graph. 
with a visual hypothesis, instead what we're doing is we're actually quickly sketching out what we think would happen. And so it's, it doesn't, right? It doesn't need labels for, at, for attributes on which axes. It doesn't need tick marks for intervals. It's just a like, is it, do we think it's going to be increasing? Do we think it's going to be decreasing? Is it staying the same? Will it be cyclical? Mm, that's the level of what we're going for. It's a quick sketch. It can be done in five, 10 seconds. Mm, but just to provide this visual cue for our learners when they're looking at their data, they can then compare that to something that is an apples to apples comparison as opposed to the written words, which is sort of an apples to elephant comparison. With the, if you go down the path of doing visual hypotheses, you can also think to extend this, right? If your students have done a visual hypothesis, they can, if you really want to hit on this, if you want to hit on kind of making predictions, thinking about your hypotheses, you could create a CER for your visual hypothesis before you even look at your data, right? You can think about what would my claim be if this is what the pattern is? What would the evidence be that would support that claim if again, how I've dri dri drawn my visual hypothesis is what happens, what would the reasoning be? And then you look at your data and you build out your CER, your claims evidence reasoning, and you compare it against what you did originally, right? So we're sort of providing more structure and support to give our learners as they're building the skill of drawing conclusions, something to compare it against. And so we're not skipping these cognitive steps. Students could also share with others their visual hypothesis, um, and someone else could write a CER off their, off their hypothesis. They could talk through, they could adjust, they could adapt, right? There's many different ways that you can integrate visual hypotheses in at the beginning before you look at your data, as well as after you've looked at your data and to be able to compare and contrast what the data actually show with generally what you were predicting and thinking you would see in the data especially for our younger learners or our learners when we're presenting them with new kinds of visualizations, new ways to look at data. One way that can be really helpful to help them build this muscle of drawing conclusions is actually providing some common answers. And so this isn't a like, you know, over, you know, overemphasize multiple choice, but sometimes if our learners are really new to making sense of data and visualizations, or it's a graphic type that they've never seen before, that's a lot of cognitive steps to get them to not only interpret visually what they're seeing on the page, understand what the pattern is in that data, and then to draw a conclusion from it. Those cognitively, that's a lot going on. And so if we want to hit on a different aspect, for example, if we really want to have our students think about visually what's going on and how is it graphed, great, then consider providing them some common answers for what the analysis would be, like what potential conclusions are from that graphic, right? We're foregrounding one skill and we're putting to the background another skill so that we're unpacking what goes into making sense of data and providing support strategically to help our students be successful rather than sort of throwing everything in the kitchen sink at once at them. Another example that we can use, and this is sort of a general building the practice, generally building our data literacy and our ability to make sense of data, is actually to explore misleading data or misinformation from data. And so a way to do this, and this can be a fun, you know, sort of Friday, fun day, and, um, find a like fun headline or a crazy headline. It can be a do now, it can be an extra credit. It's just sort of extra exposure to building that out or it can be a specific targeted activity where you're really hitting on you know like this is how we work on our claims it can be a different way of helping students figure out how to write a claim um, that's coming at it from a different direction right and the the barrier for entry is lower because they're analyzing something that somebody else has done it's not on them to be successful they're reviewing work that somebody else has done which research shows can improve their confidence and empower them to be successful so the way the strategy works is you find a claim that uses data in a misleading way be it through the internet through um, print media, different social media, different sources. There are plenty out there. Um, and then you look at the claim that, or the students look at the claim. You can easily facilitate this with your students as a group discussion and explain how the claim is misleading, right? Like 
what are the faults? What are the flaws? What's the gap in the logic? Where does the evidence not support the claim? This is where it can be helpful to not only have a headline, but have some other text as well, especially text if you can, that cites the source. If it doesn't cite the source of the data, that's a good indication. You don't want to trust the conclusion from it. Um, but being able to look back at that actual source and then have students after they've talked through like how it's misleading or what are the gaps or what's missing or what's the misinformation based on what the data actually are or what are actually showing, then have students rewrite the claim based off of the actual data. And so what we've done is we've created a space where they can assess and review something that they know is wrong and talk about why it's wrong. And in talking about why it's wrong, that actually helps us think about how to write things that are that are not wrong, that are truthful and aligned with the, what the data actually show. In a similar vein, especially for our older learners who can tackle digesting more of the primary scientific research, a great way to continue to build this skill is to have them not only read that primary research or the summaries of primary research to get a sense of what the claims are, to understand the content, like understand the finding, but having them read it to pick it apart is like, how did they actually go about building their claim? How did they put these pieces together? And so in this case, what they do is they need to identify the claim and then they write out all the evidence and reasoning statements that the original author had provided for that claim and then compare what, um, or no, so sorry. So they write out, a, they, they find a claim and then they themselves use the data to write out evidence and reasoning statements for that claim that they found from the data, and then they compare it to what the original authors wrote. You can also do it in the other direction, especially when first introducing the strategy of getting them to write down the statements that the original author wrote, and then comparing it to what they would have written. Um, it's just sometimes there's a lot of like, of course I would have said that same thing oh, if you do it in that direction. And so it's using this our innate desire and ability and great strength in mimicry to our advantage when it comes to building out the skill of making claims and drawing conclusions from data, right? We all learn how to walk by watching other people walk. <laughs> we can learn how to write our claims and we can get better at writing our claims by seeing how others have effectively written their claims and included evidence and reasoning statements from the data. So for our older students, um, our older learners, or our, our learners that are getting it, but they need, you know, we're ready to push them a little bit farther. One thing that can be good, a strategy is to argue the opposite. So we very often have our students look at data and have them make a claim or draw a conclusion or tell us, you know, what the story is from the data. It can be tricky to think about how to argue the opposite or to come up with a different claim from the data. But this is actually really helpful of like when we push ourselves to think about a second claim or an opposite claim, or what would the evidence be for the exact opposite of what I just claimed from the data? That can again build our confidence and our ability, our, our sort of strength and understanding of what it is we're actually claiming from these data. It also helps make sure that our claims coming from these data alone and that we're not sort of creeping outside of the boundary of what data we have with the claims that we're making. So they write it, they write the opposite of their claim, they write the opposite of somebody else's claim, they try to find it, but they need to have evidence to support it, right? It can't just be any claim in the world, but they need to find evidence from the graph to try to support it. And then they can talk through it with a partner, they can debate back and forth, they can critique the reasonings they've used. There's a variety of different ways that you can do this to get them actively talking and working with one another to think through, can we actually argue the opposite? And if we can't, then great, that gives us a lot of confidence in the claim that we were originally drawing from the data. If we can, then that poses some really interesting questions of, why is that? Is there something wrong with our original claim? Or are there multiple claims that we can make from these data, multiple different ways to correctly interpret these data, things like that. All of that is great data literacy and better, deeper understanding of what's going on in the data. So 
These are just some of many different strategies that are out there. These are ones that I have found to be particularly helpful and salient with the students and teachers that I work with. I encourage you to pause this video and think about some of these questions. Think about how have the ideas that, we, that I just talked through, these strategies, connect to things that you already knew or things that you're already doing? How has your thinking been extended, taking in new or further deeper directions based off of these strategies that I just talked through with data? And or what are some challenges or questions that you still have as you're thinking through utilizing some different strategies and peppering in these different strategies as you go working with your students? I encourage you to reach out with any of those questions or challenges or any other requests for assistance or other information that you have. And with that, I wish you good luck. I hope that it goes well and get our students working with data. Excellent. Thanks so much. Have a good day.